anterior dislocation is subclassified depending on where the head ends up after the dislocation. I'll show you. So it's a preglenoid, subcoracoid, subclavicular and intrathoracic. The most common is subcoracoid. So let me show you. So depending on where it ends, if it ends up just under the coracoid, coracoid is this bony prominence. If it just ends up under the coracoid, you call it subcoracoid. If it ends up under the glenoid, you call it subglenoid. If it ends up under the clavicle, you call it infraclavicular. And if it goes deep inside into the chest, that is known as intrathoracic. Okay, what is the most common type? Subcoracoid is the most common type. Now, coming to the important things about dislocations. See, first things first, any dislocation is an emergency. We'll talk about that which means we have to intervene, manage immediately. Second thing I want to remember about any type of dislocation in the body is that the patient will present to you with a typical attitude. What do you mean attitude? Attitude is not this attitude. Attitude is the attitude of the limb, the position of the limb with which the patient presents to you, to your clinic, right? The deformity, that is the word, attitude. Okay, You have to remember it because just by looking at the patient with a peculiar attitude, you can basically make a clinical diagnosis of what type of dislocation the patient has. So you have to be familiar. In fact, just memorize it. Or if you can, if you have a photographic memory, look at this image. The attitude of anterior dislocation of shoulder is arm by the side of the body. The arm will be at the side of the body, which is nothing but abducted and externally rotated shoulder. So it is abducted slightly and externally rotated. This is how the patient will present. And another important point, when there is an attitude, it means that the patient cannot perform the opposite action. So in an abducted external rotated shoulder, the patient, because of the dislocation, because the head is not in the glenoid, cannot perform the action which is opposite to it. Means the patient cannot abduct and internally rotate. Okay, so adduction and internal rotation is not possible. And this is where the examiner will play games with you. They can tell you uh, the patient has an attitude of abduction external rotation or the patient has difficulty adducting and internally rotating. Okay, so please be careful. See how you, you know, pan those questions out. Now, because the head of the humerus is not in the glenoid, what will happen to this beautiful shoulder contour that you have? It will be flattened. Are you noticing it? It will be flattened. The beautiful shoulder contour will be flattened. And that is how the patient will walk into the clinic with an abducted and externally rotated shoulder and a flattened shoulder contour. And then you call him, you make him sit down and you examine him clinically. You have a few clinical tests to diagnose the dislocation. Let me show you those tests. Hamilton Ruler's test, Dugas test, Callaway's test and Bryant's test. Alright, so let me show you what these tests are. The first is Hamilton ruler test. In Hamilton ruler test, if you keep a scale, if you keep a ruler on the lateral post part of the shoulder and the lateral epicondyle, that ruler will never touch the acromion. Can you see this? It is not touching the acromion because the head of the humerus is there. But in case of a dislocation, the head of the humerus would be dislocated. So this ruler would easily touch the acromion. This is known as Hamilton ruler test test. The second test is the Dugas test where you ask the patient to touch the opposite shoulder because the patient already has abduction and external rotation. He cannot adduct and internally rotate and touch the opposite shoulder. And the only way he can touch the opposite shoulder is if he lifts his hand up like this. So it becomes difficult. So adduction and internal rotation and touching the opposite shoulder is difficult. That is your Dugas test. What is Callaway's test and what is Bryant's test? Callaway's test is when you measure the girth of the axilla. When you measure the girth of the axilla. When the head dislocates, the girth of the shoulder or the girth of the axilla will increase. That is your Callaway's test. And finally, Bryant's test. What is Bryant's test? The vertical circumference or this vertical axis of the shoulder will come down because of the dislocation of the shoulder. Not very important. Please don't forget Hamilton ruler test. Please don't forget Dugas test, Callaway's test. These are the three important tests. Bryant's test also is a test that you use to diagnose shoulder dislocation. Vertical axillary circumference increases. Okay, so you've understood this clinically. One very important thing I want you to also assess at the time of presentation is the function of the nerve that can most likely get injured in shoulder dislocation, which is axillary nerve. See, axillary nerve runs in very close proximity to the shoulder joint. 
as you can see in the image it comes down like this and it runs very closely to the shoulder joint very very closely to the shoulder joint so whenever there is a shoulder dislocation or in fact any pathology that affects this area axillary nerve is very likely to get injured okay so in a case of a shoulder dislocation axillary nerve will invariably get injured now when the axillary nerve gets injured obviously motor is supplied by deltoid and teres minor we have read that in nerve injuries and sensory is this area that is supplied by the axillary nerve what do you call this area you call this area regimental badge area why do you call it regimental badge area because this is where the regiments military men soldier policemen put their badges a regimental badge area so when the axillary nerve is injured how will you clinically evaluate this you can't check for motor activity because the shoulder is already dislocated there is already pain and it's already stuck in abduction external rotation how will you test for deltoid and teres minor you can't so please don't say because axillary nerve is paralyzed deltoid and teres minor is paralyzed an antagonistic group of muscles will overpower and cause deformity don't go that line it's not going to happen the shoulder is already dislocated and there is already a deformity so you can't test for motor function what you will be able to test for is the sensory function so how will you test for the sensory function you test for sensation in this area so patient will complain of paresthesia or pain or tenderness in that area that is what we call as the regimental badge sign okay regimental badge sign once you have assessed all of these things we are confident that it's a dislocation but we have to confirm it with the help of an x-ray and you do an x-ray what will you find you will find that the head of the humerus is not in the glenoid which can be the case in the ap view the head of the humerus is not in the glenoid the head of the humerus is not in the glenoid but the challenge here is friends in an ap view you will be only able to appreciate the head is not in the glenoid but you will not be able to appreciate if it's an anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation because they will look the same on x-ray so that is why you have to take a lateral view and in lateral view you'll be able to appreciate whether it's anterior or posterior dislocation okay that is when you'll be able to appreciate anterior or posterior dislocation so this is an ap view glenoid head of the humerus not in place dislocation lateral view head of the humerus gone anteriorly anterior shoulder dislocation you can take ap view lateral view and for lateral view there is another view called as axillary view that can also help you okay so far you have understood everything so far it's very easy clinical presentation how you diagnosed it how you took the x-ray and how you assess the neurological uh, examination of a patient axillary nerve is injured now coming to the management i told you any dislocation is an emergency reduce it emergently as soon as possible so when you have to reduce any dislocation you'll have to apply force and you have to apply force in a particular maneuver so you have to memorize the maneuvers so the first maneuver i want you to remember is modified cocker's technique what do you do in modified cocker's technique and they have asked you the steps first you apply traction to the limb that is already dislocated in whatever position it is traction then you do external rotation traction external rotation then you adduct it towards the body and then once you've adducted it you go for internal or medial rotation the mnemonic is very simple t e a m let me show you so it's abducted and external rotated to start with right so you give traction you give external rotation and then you adduct it and then you do medial rotation essentially you're bringing the hand to the opposite shoulder meaning you're reducing the shoulder joint okay so this is your modified cocker's technique the other technique is stimson's technique Stimson's technique is a very straightforward simple technique what you do is you tie a heavy object or traction to the limb that is dislocated and you hang the limb over the bed or the table and then you wait for a few minutes um, somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes and slowly but surely it will reduce back to its place this is your Stimson's maneuver the other maneuver which is not commonly practiced is Hippocrates technique because you can see why because the doctor has to shove his foot up the man's axilla and uh, try to reduce it to force uh, risk of a lot of complication that's why it's not preferred these days